So thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here. However, unfortunately, I'm not sure that I have completely recovered from jet lag. However, very fortunately, most of this talk or is based on joint work with a student I have the great fortune of advising, Yang Lu, who is in the audience. So if the jet lag catches up with me and I start make, stop making sense at any point in this talk, um, Yang, you're, you know, you can, you're on deck. <laughs> um, and even, uh, even if that doesn't happen, I encourage you all to ask Yang questions after or during the talk as well as myself. So this talk's primarily gonna be based on this joint work with Yang, as well as um, more recent work that uh, um, was also achieved uh, simultaneously by Tarun Kathuria. All right. So this talk is going to have two parts. First, I'm going to give a brief survey of what the recent results are and what I'll be covering in the talk. And the second part, I'll give a roadmap for recent advances. So first, this quick survey of some advances that have happened on the maximum flow problem on unit capacity graphs, as the title suggests, and then a little bit more technical of a roadmap for how to actually achieve them. All right. So most of this talk or the entirety of this talk will be focusing on the following problem, the maximum flow problem, which Yang also has already presented on yesterday and was discussed a bit this morning. So I'll be a little briefer in some of the introduction in this talk. So we'll be solving the maximum flow problem. Again, as you all know, we're given some graph G. We'll have some N vertices V and some edges M edges E. We'll be given some integer capacities U between uh, one and capital U. And we'll give in two special vertices S and T. And our goal is to compute a maximum flow from S to T. So a flow for the sake of this talk, I'm just going to think of as any real valued assignment of uh, values to the edges of the graph, specifying how much flow goes over every edge. We'll call something an ST flow if all the flow that goes into a vertex is the same as the amount of flow that leaves a vertex for every vertex that's not S and T. And we'll say if an ST flow is feasible or it meets the capacity constraints, if in the case of directed graphs, the flow on every edge is between zero and the capacity of the edge. And in the undirected case, well, this is when the flow on every edge is between minus the capacity of the edge and the capacity of the edge. Now, given a feasible ST flow, the value of the flow is the total amount of flow leaving S or equivalently entering T. And that's our goal to compute a ST flow that is feasible of maximum value. Um, why do you want to, um, oh, in this talk, though, we'll be focusing on the special case of unit capacity or unweighted graphs, which is just the special case when all the capacities are one. Um, this special case encompasses already a number of fundamental problems you might want to solve, like computing a maximum cardinality matching in a bipartite graph, computing a minimum SD cut, or computing the maximum number of disjoint paths you can hope to find between S and T. All right, now why do you want to study the maximum flow problem or study this? I guess uh, this has already probably been covered to this point, but it's a very fundamental problem that is a stepping stone towards solving a variety of graph optimization problems and has is a nice proving ground for developing new algorithmic techniques and has a history of new algorithmic techniques for the problem leading to broader techniques of you know, broader utility. All right, so what's the state of the art for solving the maximum flow problem on unit capacity graphs? Um, there was a line of work uh, many years ago that culminated in these results in the 70s of solving the problem the better of the number of edges the three halves and the number of edges times the number of vertices times n to the two thirds. And until the last five years, the state of the art was due to these pair of improvements by Madri, uh, Yintat Lee, and myself. So I usually need a cheat sheet for passing these runtime. So 10, so. On the one hand, Madri had this beautiful result that showed you can improve in the sparse case, m to the three halves to m to the 10 sevenths, where 10 sevenths is three halves minus one over 14. Um, and Yinta Lee and I had this result that you can improve in the dense case, the m times n to the two thirds to m times uh, m root n. Both cases, these results were built on interior point methods and a number of optimization techniques that have been useful for a number of improvements. All right, and the main question in this talk is what's happened since and how can we improve in the case of solving maximum flow on unit capacity graphs? Um, and interesting, there wasn't any improvements on this until just the last two years. Um, now, to situate these results and explain them, I think it's helpful to think about um, these previous works and interior point methods th uh, through the lens of a number of interesting works that's happened for solving a broader class of problems on undirected graphs. 
So to explain these results, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to introduce a broader problem of solving flow optimization problems on undirected graphs. So in this broader problem, we're just now going to have a, a unit capacity graph G it will be undirected. So we'll think of flow going both directions over every edge. We again have two vertices S and T and our goal, rather than necessarily solving the maximum flow problem is going to be send one unit of flow from S to T in the best way possible. So we're gonna broaden the set of sort of objectives we're considering over routing problems on graph for sending flow from S to T. Rather than trying to send as much flow as possible, we're gonna send one unit in the best way possible. All right. Now, depending what objective we pick, we get different problems. Um, on the one hand, you might try to minimize the L1 norm of the flow or the total length of the flow or the sum over all the edges, the amount of flow on every edge. And if you think about this problem a little bit, a unit ST flow can always be decomposed into a distribution over ST paths and a circulation. If you want to minimize the length, you might as well not have any in the circulation. And in that case, you know, the length of the flow is the expected lengths of the paths. So if you're minimizing this, you might as well pick the shortest paths. We can solve this problem in near linear time through a nice local greedy algorithm where we start at S and incrementally compute distances. We have a local near linear time greedy algorithm that solves the problem. All right. On the other extreme, we try to minimize what's known as the congestion of the flow or the L infinity norm of the flow or only the most flow that we put on any edge. And if you think about this problem a little bit, this problem is actually equivalent to solving maximum flow. If you have a unit SD flow that puts at most one over 100 units of flow on every edge, if you scale it up by 100, you now have a, a flow that sends 100 units from S to T, putting at most one unit of flow on every edge. So by scaling, this problem is equivalent to maximum flow. We're now no longer looking for a single flow. We're looking for the maximum number of disjoint paths we can get between S and T. Sorry, we're not looking for a single path. We're looking for a maximum number of disjoint paths. The solution is a bit more global. This is the same as computing a minimum SD cut in value. There's, and correspondingly, until recently, and um, all regimes, the fastest algorithms we had for solving this problem were not linearly linear as they were in the case of um, shortest path. All right. So now if your goal very broadly is develop new primitives for solving graph optimization problems and expand the toolkit of what sort of global properties of graphs we can compute in near linear time. If the L1 problem is local, but um, local, but you can compute in near linear time, the L infinity problem is more global, but it's more expensive to compute. Natural thing to try is really something in between. So in right. Rather than minimizing the L1 norm, we could try to minimize the L2 norm, also known as the energy, which is equivalent to minimizing the sum over all the edges, the flow on the edge squared. And this problem is known as the electric flow problem. It's equivalent to solving Laplacian systems. The solution to it is, um, in many cases, not a single SD path, rather a distribution of plasmas and some much more global property. But nevertheless, due to a beautiful, very influential result of Spielman and Tang in 2004, um, this problem can be solved in near linear time. All right. And given a new near linear time global primitive for processing graphs, the natural thing you might try to do is use it to solve things like the maximum flow problem. And you can think about these different classes of undirected flow problems as a lens. Um, I think that's going to turn off in a second. <laughs> um, so you can think of these different flow problems as a lens for thinking about some of the advances that have happened on solving the maximum flow problem. So you can think of some of the classic combinatorial algorithms as computing a path or a, a sequence of paths. You might think that they're using some sort of L1-ish like problem repeatedly to solve the L infinity problem of maximum flow. And interior point methods in a very strong me sense are an iterative method that use these L2 flows to solve the L infinity problem. So with this in mind, if we want to get even faster algorithms, maybe we just need to build stronger undirected flow primitives and use them to solve maximum flow faster. All right. Um, and this story I just said actually has played out already um, over the last number of years for solving maximum flow approximately on undirected graphs. So if you have an undirected graph and rather than computing the maximum flow, you want to get a flow that um, has value with at least one minus epsilon that of opt, there's been a line of work on this problem. There are some combinatorial-ish algorithms that use maybe L1-ish like procedures. There were advances using electric flow to improve. And then there was a line of work that showed you could actually solve this problem in nearly linear time. And the way these procedures worked was by working more directly with L infinity. 
So they use sort of combinatorial techniques tailored to L infinity, optimization methods tailored to L infinity. And these are procedures that have, you know, given um, a number of implications and faster algorithms beyond just solving maximum flow. All right. So with this, there's a natural thing we can try. Maybe we should use these tools directly towards solving uh, maximum flow exactly. You know, we have these new primitives for processing L infinity approximately on undirected graphs. Maybe we can use them in some interior point like method and get faster run times for maximum flow. This is a great idea. It was the first thing, one of the first things uh, we tried and some others when came up with some of these combinatorial primitives. Um, I don't know how to do this directly. I don't know for sure you can't, but uh, I don't know how to do it. It's an interesting pro problem. So maybe the issue with this is we just need something stronger. Maybe we can't just use uh, you know, this, these, these approximate L infinity procedures. Maybe we need something else that's even more powerful. So we also tried this for a while, we tried coming up with asymmetric generalizations of uh, solving Laplacian systems. Uh, there's also been a number of interesting works on solving LP flow problems. I think this line of work is very interesting. It's led to new near linear time algorithms in different regimes, but I don't know how to use either of these things directly to solve directed maximum flow. Okay, so maybe we just need an even stronger primitive. And fortunately for this, there was this really cool result of uh, King, who's in the audience, Peng, Sashteva, and Wang, that showed the following. They showed that you could solve this undirected flow problem in almost linear time. So what they showed is that you can solve the problem of find a unit ST flow where the objective is some part of an weighted electric flow objective. So the sum over all the edges, a weighted amount of the flow on the edge squared, plus the sum over all the edges of the flow on the edge to some power. So again, this is an undirected flow opti optimization problem. We're just optimizing again over unit SD flows like I had on that other slide. Um, and now we are, if we, if we didn't have this term at all, this would be exactly the electric flow problem. And we're adding this term that's the flow on every edge raised to the high power. And you can think this is a max flow type thing. You know, if P was, we took the limit as P going to infinity, this would be exactly solving the L infinity problem, which I said is max flow. Yes? For every R. For, for every, for any R, yes. Uh, polynomially bounded or quasi polynomially bounded. Um, they could be zero, I believe. But uh, King is in the audience, so maybe you should, uh, we should, we should confirm his results with that. <laughs> but yeah, the, the R's could be zero. But yeah, the R, the R could be zero. So think this is, um, you know, for P at this amount, it's kind of crudely solving maximum flow approximately by itself, if that's what you're, you're going yeah, towards. Yeah, like yes, and hold that thought. We will hopefully in about 10 minutes bring this up yet again. But yes, this is approximately solving max flow by itself. Okay. All right, so can we use this to solve maximum flow faster? And that's the punchline of this talk. Indeed, you can. Um, so again, I need the handy cheat sheet. So in this joint work, this uh, 10 sevenths, which is 3 halves minus 1 over 14, was first improved to 11 eighths, which is 3 halves minus 1 over 8. And the current state of the art in this sparse regime is 4 thirds, which is 3 halves minus 1 over 6. Um, in my opinion, the result of this is a slightly simpler algorithm than the, these algorithms get simpler and simpler in, so, in some ways that came before. However, um, it's using, you know, a stronger primitive. It's using, it's, it's only sim it's simpler at the moment when if you black box have these L2 plus LP solver. And it's worth noting that this, these improvements have been leveraged for some broader problems like minimum cost flow. Um, as you've seen from other, some of the other talks uh, today and yesterday, there's a number of other exciting results on maximum flow. This is just this, um, the state of the art for improvements of unit capacity max flow on sparse graphs. Um, there was recent work showing that on both uh, unit capacity graphs and on capacitated graphs, max flow can be solved in near linear time on dense graphs. And there is this recent work showing that on capacitated graphs, you can get faster algorithms. There's also a whole line of work on strongly polynomial max flow I'm not talking about. And with this, this is the state of the art for max flow right now. So that's it for uh, the survey. What I'm gonna do in the next little bit is try to give a taste of how these recent improvements work. I'm actually primarily gonna focus on these 11 ace algorithm, which I think helps giving some nice intuition over improvements that came from the previous 10 sevenths and a taste of where the four thirds come from. And in the time I have left, I plan on giving the intuition behind that result. 
But any questions before I do any of that? All right, our goal for the rest of the talk clear at least. All right. All right, so um, what I'm gonna describe is, um, I'm gonna start by describing a fairly broad strategy for solving maximum flow. What I'm gonna describe is sort of the framework mostly inspired by this result of Madri in 2016. And I'm gonna talk about how we modify it towards getting the 11 eighths. And at the very end, just touch briefly upon how it's modified for four thirds. So I'm going to hide a lot of technical details where we go, and there may be slight mismessages between what I say and exactly what's in the paper. When that happens, please ask Yang. And at the end of the at the end of the talk, um, but hopefully, um, but more seriously, this is just to convey the main ideas underlying these algorithms. All right, so here's our broad strategy we're going to follow. First, there's some pre-processing I'm mostly going to ignore. We're going to assume the graph is undirected. There's a strategy for doing that. We'll add some extra edges between S and T for technical reasons. And we'll use a well-known fact that if we solve the maximum flow until the residual capacity is some M to the eta, then we could exactly solve the problem in a remaining M to the one plus eta time. Uh, this is just by using uh, making the flow integer and then running augmenting paths to get the last few little bit of flow. All right, and now we're going to try to solve the problem with an interior point method. And the way to think of this method is we're going to have some sort of SD flow and we're going to iteratively try to improve it. Um, like with many interior point methods, there's going to be a trade off between somehow trying to improve the objective, which in this case is sending more flow, and something about staying away from the constraints or not getting too flow close to saturating any of the constraints. And as with many interior point methods, we'll somehow trade off the two. All right, now, like with a number of uh, attempts to improve the runtime for max flow using interior point methods, a lot of ways of doing this naively, given M to the three halves algorithm, stemming from a root M iteration algorithm where the cost of every iteration is computing an electric flow, which is linear time. And the main magic is to somehow improve these bounds. Improving the root M for interior point methods in general is a huge open problem in theory. And we're gonna try to do something special in this case using um, a number of a number of tricks to improve this runtime. All right, so this in mind, let me be a little more specific about this framework and tell you the main pieces. So I'm gonna start just by telling you what the state of the algorithm is that we're gonna maintain. So the algorithm is gonna maintain at all points an ST flow F of some value V, where we're gonna change V, it's gonna only increase. And we're gonna maintain a set of forward weights and backward weights. These are non-negative numbers assigned to the edges, care, keeping track of how much we care about penalizing, getting close to saturating the, con, the, constraint, the, the capacity constraints in one direction and in the other direction. Now with all of this, the way we're gonna measure the quality of the flow or think about the flow that we want is we're gonna try to keep that their flow is minimizing the following weighted potential. And this is simply a, a potential that sums over all the edges and looks at how uh, some penalty towards, towards um, meeting, hitting the capacity constraints in the forward direction, weighted by the forward weights, plus some penalty on hitting the capacity constraints in the reverse direction, weighted by the reverse weights. Okay, this is what we'll keep track of. Um, uh, for uh, brevity, you know, the set of all ST flows of value V. Um, the, uh, the, the sum of the flow leaving an edge minus that entering an edge for every vertex is a linear constraint. I'm gonna use B, B transpose F equals uh, this to denote this linear constraint. And again, our objective is gonna keep track of how much we're penalizing the forward and backward constraints. Okay, so that's the general framework. And now the, that's, this is what we're keeping track of. And now the way the method's gonna work, and this is building off this framework of Madri in 2016 is the following. What we're going to do is use the fact that if F is close to minimizing this weighted log barrier, then we can take a few projected Newton steps to get closer. And these projected Newton steps are essentially solving certain electric flow problems. What this says is that if we're close to minimizing the weighted log barrier in some sense, then with a few electric flows, we can be very close to near exactly minimizing the weighted log barrier. All right, so we'll often be in between iterates, assuming that our flow essentially exactly minimizes the weighted log barrier. When we do this, um, we're then gonna try to make some progress step where we're gonna increase the value of V. Say our goal is to now send more uh, delta more units of flow. So we'll increase V by delta and we'll compute some unit ST flow as F tilde and add delta units of it to now have a flow of value V plus delta, all right? Now, um, 
one way that uh, sometimes this F tilde or, or often will be chosen is the following. We'll let R be um, the, the diagonal of the Hessian. These are natural choices of weights on every edge. Um, and what we'll do is consider this F tilde to be the electric flow for those resistances. So we'll take the natural second order approximation to the weighted log barrier and use that to give the electric flow problem inducing the flow we want to send. Right now, if you run exactly this method and don't change it too much, so compute this sort of augmenting electric flow, send more units of flow, center and repeat, this gives an m to the three halves algorithm. Um, the way Madri's m to the 10 sevenths algorithms work were um, modifying this algorithm by instead of just keeping the weights constant, finding careful ways of modifying the weights locally to improve um, the rate. Um, and the way these improvements, uh, recent improvements work is by doing a, some sort of more global computation to compute these weights. Um, though I should note the most recent method doesn't quite need to center use augmenting electric flows in quite the same way. Okay, so let's think about to motivate these changes. Let's, let me start talking a bit more about how we're gonna analyze this algorithm. Any questions on the setup so far? All right, so this is the one more thing to add to it. This is probably the most technical part in thinking about the analysis of the algorithm. And the way we're going to think about analyzing the algorithm is a sort of natural standard thing in interior point methods for max flow, um, in, or particular for max flow, is we're going to think about the congestion of these augmenting electric flows or augmenting flows in general. So we have our current flow. We solve this electric flow problem to get the flow we want to send. And to think about the quality of this augmenting electric flow and how much progress we can make, how much flow we can send, well, we're gonna use these vec this vector known as a congestion vector. So I'm gonna define uh, row plus and row minus to be the forward and backward congestion. So row plus is the, for every edge, is the magnitude of the flow on the edge divided by the residual capacity in the forward direction. And row minus is the same thing, just the residual capacity in the reverse direction. This is, if we look at rho then, this congestion vector, just to be the concatenation of the two, this gives a natural bound on how much flow we can send before we hit the capacity constraints. You know, if we weren't taking absolute value and we like played with signs accordingly, it plays with signs a bit, um, then one of the two would be exactly how much flow we can send in one of the two directions. And we'll use this absolute value as an upper bound, All right? Now, the way we'll think about, a natural way to think about analyzing this method is through different measures of the congestion vector. So as I just described, if we look at the L infinity norm of the congestion vector, so the largest entry of either of these, then you can show that as long as the delta as the amount of flow we try to send is at most one over the L infinity norm of this congestion vector, the resulting flow will be feasible. Right? As I just described, this is like an upper bound on how much flow you can send while being feasible, and it can be tight in some cases. Okay. Um, on the other hand, we might we're going to also consider sometimes like weighted um, p norm uh, measures of the congestion vector. And you can show that as long as the, um, the amount of flow we send is at most one over the L4 norm of the congestion vector, you can show that the, after you take the step, you're close enough to the weighted, uh, the weighted uh, uh, potential that you can center in just a polylog number of electric flows. So you can send a flow up to one over the L4 norm and still be able to recenter, minimize the weighted log barrier near the near time. Um, lastly, if we look at the L2 norm of the electric flow vector, this corresponds to the energy of the electric flow. And standard in the interior point analysis, if we'd set the amount of flow we sent to be one over the L2 norm, this is enough to guarantee a root M iteration algorithm. So we can send up to the L4 norm, well, L infinity norm while being feasible, L4 norm while being able to center, and L2 suffices to get a room at M iteration algorithm, All right? So what this says, if we could just somehow always pick Delta to be sufficiently larger than one over the L2 norm, we'd get a faster method. Just, yeah. So um, is there any dependence on the weights in this? Like, I mean, do the weights need to satisfy anything? Um, for other reasons that'll show up, the weights end up being always larger than one. And bounded and bounded by O of n. Okay. Is, but, o of but, m is what ends up using. But I, um, 
Ah, sorry. So I guess. So weight should be larger than one makes sense to me, but yeah. Like, I mean. Yeah, I guess I guess this delta for an iteration algorithm, as long as the delta, the, they're bounded by, th those two properties I think make this true. Yeah. Yang, am I? Yeah, all right, good. <laughs> to double check. Great, good question. But yes, I guess I guess if we start letting the weights vary too much that these claims might not be true in the same way. That's a very good point. Okay. All right, so, so what is the bad case? So when can we not sort of improve on M to the three halves and get this magical result? The case is when somehow, you know, the L2 norm is the same as the four norm. And we could, we could send more flow. The case where we can't send more flow, but maybe not be able to center is when the L2 norm is like the infinity norm. And when is the case that these norms are all the same? The case when the norms are all the same is when the congestion vector is sparse in some, in some sense. Actually using different ratios of these norms being small is a natural like numerical measure of how sparse the congestion vector is in some sense. Okay. So what this says is that we can somehow modify things to make the L4 norm better, the congestion vector non-sparse in some way, we could hope to get a faster method. And the way that um, this was handled in, in these uh, beautiful results of Madri was um, through this observation that if somehow the L2 norm is really like the L infinity norm, then if you increase the resistance of the congested edges, then the energy goes up, the energy of the electric flow. And the energy of the electric flow can only be so high. So this says you only need to do so many perturbations before, you know, say the L infinity norm is better, right? So this suggests an approach towards being able to take a larger step, you know, increase the weights in order to increase the, uh, Oh yeah, so energy with like weighted energy. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so so um, um, this creates a natural. So this says like there's if we could increase these weights, we could hopefully make the congestion these other measures better. Um, but unfortunately, if we just tried you know increasing the weights to increase the resistances, this might change how centered we are with respect to the weighted log barrier. For, fortunately, there was a nice trick shown in Madri, which is the following, that if we look at the gradient of the weighted log barrier, you know, it looks like this, you know, we have a contribution from the forward and backward weights. And what we could always do because their opposite sign is increase both of them at the right ratio to preserve centrality, which would increase the resistances. So the way this algorithm worked in this paper was then finding carefully increasing the weights to preserve centrality and sort of trading off the energy increase from that versus the decrease from taking steps. And that kind of trade off of the local changes gave, gave the 10 sevenths algorithm. All right, so how do we improve this? Um, one natural idea is if the goal of this was to sort of increase the energy so we can control things like the LN4, the infinity norm, we could just kind of directly compute what is the maximum changes of the weights to, to increase the energy under some sort of budget. So as, I, as we just talked about, you don't want to, for the analysis to go through, we don't want the weights to get too large. So you could ask under some sort of budget of weight change, you know, what can you do with the energy and hope from the optimality of that, we could control these other measures of congestion. So we could just write down that optimization problem. We have some budget for how much, uh, from, from the centrality argument, the cost of a certain amount of resistance increase in terms of weight changes, we can let W be this budget and we could write down the optimization problem of the maximum energy under this budget. And you can check the dual of it, you get the following optimization problem, which is some L weighted L2 plus some uh, weighted L infinity problem, but it's an undirected flow problem. So we could try to solve this undirected flow problem. And you know, what if we could just solve this undirected flow problem? Unfortunately, there's a slight issue for this. This undirected flow problem, if, as was already suggested, this is why I said, hold that thought, we let the resistances be zero, and we pick the weights on the infinity part approximately. This just is you know, minimizing L infinity over unit flows, and this is just maximum flow. So solving this is unfortunately just as hard as solving the maximum flow problem. Um, but what if we could approximately solve the problem? If you could approximately solve the problem and you get the corresponding, you know, bounds on congested, you could just approximately solve it, take the step, do a little bit correction to help the L4 norm and center and repeat. And that, uh, yeah. 
So I think I'm almost over on time. I was just going to give the ideas of the last like two slides and then take all the questions that, that people want to fit because I think I'm a little about to run over on time. So, yeah. All right. Anyway, that gives it now. So I'm almost over on time. Happy, happy to discuss a bit. Um, so we just need to make this problem efficient. Fortunately, this problem is very close to the P norm problem I showed before. There's some key differences like L infinity versus LP, but you know, I could hope it's a close enough for approximation. There are edge resistances. This is um, the dual and we actually want to get flows. Um, sorry, this is the dual flow problem. We want the weights. There's standard tricks you can use to map between primal and dual. Um, you know, there's not the same power on each of these terms, but there's a nice trick you can use for that. And unfortunately, the primitive I said, um, you know, the primitive I said, uh, you know, was just F to the P and this seems like some weighted version. And that, that one's actually a little bit of a problem. So that, that one actually takes a little bit more care. Um, but, but there's a natural idea you might try for that last one. You know, you could just set the C to be, you know, the identity so you could run the Oracle and cross your fingers. And uh, turns out that that works if you're very careful and use that Oracle and think carefully about what weight changes were necessary or not. You can show you still get the analysis of if you had the weighted solver without actually needing the weighted solver. Um, trading this off gives 11 eighths. And to improve further, if this whole analysis was to sort of get to use the L4 norm reasoning for centering, if instead you play with things a bit more to think about when you could really compute the next point and try to reason a little bit more about the corresponding analysis in L infinity, that gives the improvement. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you.